Okay. Uh, so it is now 1205. So I think let's, uh, let's get started. So welcome everyone uh, to this AMA session hosted by CSMP. And we're here with some leaders of the Diana Initiative, Virginie Robbins and Nicole Schwartz. And today we're going to be talking about the Diana Initiative, which is an information security conference focused on women, diversity, and inclusion. And we'll also be discussing their CF CFP process, how to submit a CFP, and give everyone tips on submitting a CFP, giving their first presentation, really any questions that you have about giving a presentation at a conference. And just a little bit about CSMP, we are a cybersecurity nonprofit focused on creating free resources to create and improve diversity and inclusion within the cybersecurity industry. We host meetups. We have chapters all over the US and Africa and in India and in Canada. And that's our goal. It's really to get more people into cybersecurity. If you're interested in learning more about CSMP, there are links in the chat. You can go to csmp.org and if you want to learn a little bit more about the diana initiative you can also go to dianainitiative.org which is also in the chat uh and so i guess for us to get started um i know i briefly touched on the diana initiative but uh virginie can you give us a little bit more background about the diana initiative and its mission Okay, absolutely. Um, so to give you a little background to begin with, uh, how did uh, the initiative start it? Um, so we were, uh, like it was like in 2016, uh, we were at DEF CON and uh, I was trying to make connections, you know, and, uh, and there was this call for uh, meeting up, having a, a lunch, a woman lunch meetup sort of things like that. Um, so I just went there and there was all these women. Uh, it was actually a fast food place in the, uh, in the back, in the downstairs of uh, the Bali. And we decided that, you know, there's not a lot of uh, way for women to connect and for diversity to connect uh, a DEF CON and it's so big, we don't know where to go. We, uh, so, we decided, why don't we next year uh, do a little uh, get together, you know, in a suite or something, and and you know, bring more diversity like that and make more connection with women and and so on. So the next year, we we decided to um, to do a little conference in a suite, and it was so well uh, taken that. Uh, there was people waiting at the door, like there was a huge line uh, and everyone loved it. Uh, so the year after we created the, the Dine Initiative um, and we had also another event conference and it was even bigger and everyone was more excited about it. So the third year we totally went crazy and got a hotel, got a, a world hotel uh, for us, the world floor, and we had uh, one of the biggest conference we had for that initiative. Um, and then after COVID hit, so we decided to go virtual, but pretty much like every year, more and more um, uh, diversity and women got interested into uh, participating and attending and wanting to join. Uh, so we felt like they were like so much interest uh, so what what is the initiative? It's uh, it's really two things. It's an organization that wants to promote and support and uh, help uh, women diversity and and uh, and everyone that wants to participate. Really, uh, we are like uh, all uh, all inclusive, like very inclusive uh, conference. Um, and then uh, it's also kind of like. Uh, 
we have a mission that we want to help. Uh, anyway, we can just even be on the conference. We want to help uh, promote uh, diversity in general, like all uh, like all gender, um, all races. Um, you know, basically, it's like uh, we want to ensure that the inf information security community is um, is. Uh, well balanced uh, across uh, gender, race, um, uh, you know, and so basically that's what we. <laughs> I didn't rehearse. I'm sorry. <laughs> and you want to add something, Nicole? <laughs> yeah, I think you basically covered it. Yeah, it's about okay. how do we get everyone in information security to reflect everyone that's in the world and. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows that isn't quite the case right now. Right. And Nicole, how did you get involved with the Diana Initiative? Uh, accidentally. <laughs> I'm sure everyone in information security uh, has a volunteering problem. Uh, and I think uh, most people on staff at Diana have that same problem. So I was a speaker a couple of years ago and uh, I had an idea. I'm like, hey, why don't we do, you know, some you know mentorship or other programs next year and Virginia was like great you're running it and I'm like got it <laughs> uh, and uh, that's that's how that went nice and there's a question in the chat from Virginia Jacob she wants to know uh, why the name Diana oh that's an excellent question um, so originally we wanted to have a vibe where we would be like a uh, superhero you know, everyone is a superhero. Everyone can take initiative and and do uh, and do this. You know, if you really get your heart uh, up to uh, to take action, you you have to be the one to take initiative. You sh you shouldn't wait for someone else to do it. You know, <laughs> because if you wait, it might never happen. <laughs> so uh, so it was kind of like the vibe of uh, being a superhero. And Diana is actually Wonder Woman. <laughs> So we had so, we started like that. Yeah, all the comic fans probably yeah. figured that one out. But if you're not a comic fan, it's a, kind of a veiled reference. Yeah, and also Diana is the goddess of I don't know what. It's, uh, so it's like we wanted to 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 empower women, and the best way to empower women to make them uh, understand that. Uh, they can be strong enough to do this, you know, to not give up. So. Nice. Okay. And so we can move on to talking a little bit more about the CFP process. What kind of topics do uh, you usually see people present on at the Diana Initiative Conference? So we actually, it's very interesting. We do feedback each year at the end of the event. Um, and we get a bunch of feedback that says, I want more technical stuff. I have a bunch of people who give like probably an equal amount of people that say, I wanna see more professional development stuff. And then you get a whole bunch of people who are like the mix is perfect. Uh, so we've been continuing to go for just as equally balanced as possible. And that means that we wanna have red team talks, blue team talks, professional development talks, getting into information security talks. And so we try and cover a little something for everyone. Thanks. Uh, and then also for all of our attendees, any questions that you have, you can submit uh, some questions through the Q&A button at the bottom, and then we'll be able to answer them as we go. Uh, and so, okay, so those are the topics that we, that you would usually see presented on at the conference. Uh, and have either of you given presentations before? Do you remember your first presentation? What was that process like for you? I actually was lucky enough to do uh, B-Sides Las Vegas Proving Ground as my first uh, information security talk. I'd given uh, talks like at work to large groups of people and stuff before, but not to a conference. And so I was able to have a mentor kind of walk me through uh, the process, which is why we set up a mentorship program at Diana, because I found that 
very uh, useful. And the interesting thing is, and I am not alone, uh, I've asked this on Twitter, I don't remember any talks that I give because as soon as I get up on stage, I black out. <laughs> so it's super critical for me to practice a lot before I get up on stage. And then when I go, I'm able to interact with the audience, go through my slides, ad lib, but I just stress out so much, I can't actually remember it. So a lot of times I'll watch after and be like, oh, okay, I did a pretty good job or oops, I should have, you know, practiced that part a little bit more. Nice. And yeah, what about Virginia? Actually, we had the same experience because my first uh, talk was also at uh, Beside Las Vegas Proving Ground. Uh, I remember giving a, a malware uh, talk, anti malware talk. And uh, I remember talking very fast and not really spelling very well. And uh, it was very boring because of that. <laughs> 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 but it went well. Uh, yeah. So that, that's why, you know, I like uh, the idea of mentoring because that's, uh, it's, it feels less, less frightening for uh, someone that never presented to feel like they can get a mentor that can uh, coach them on, on just not just their presentation abstract, but the presentation itself. Uh, so I said that was pretty neat if we could do that. Uh, and this year, we're definitely going to do that. Uh, thank you, Nicole. She's going to be uh, uh, leading that effort. So. Nice. So you're going, so the Diana Initiative is going to have a mentorship program around her, your first presentation, creating a presentation and stuff like that? Yep. We are currently accepting more mentors. So if anybody in the audience has given talks um, any number of times, you're in a position where someone who's given zero talks can learn from you. Uh, and so please sign up on our volunteer page. Uh, we are offering any of our speakers who need assistance, someone to kind of bounce things off of. And an accountability buddy also is really helpful, so. Awesome. Uh, and can you give us a little bit of a background on what the CFP submission process is like for the Diana Initiative? We're using BusyConf, which some conferences use. There's a lot of tools out there. That's the one that we settled on. It does require you to make an account and that's so that we can email you. You can use you know, a specific email that you set up for the conference if you want, or you can use your regular email. We are not gonna spam you. We're gonna tell you the rounds closing, the rounds opening, you got accepted, you didn't. Like it's, you know, we're not, in fact, even if you're an attendee, we don't sell our lists of attendees at all, uh, which does make it hard for us to get sponsors in some cases, but yeah. So please do, don't worry about making the BusyConf uh, account. Uh, and once you make it, it's going to ask you for some information about yourself. Now, the way that you in enter that information is such that you want people who are attending the conference, if you're accepted as a speaker to see. So do you want them to see your Twitter? Do you want them to see your LinkedIn? Do you want them to see a picture of you or a little cartoon drawing of you, you know, whatever. Um, but actually the reviewers are not going to see that. So there's two kinds of CFPs. Well, there's many different kinds, but in general, there's blind and not blind. And by blind, we mean that the reviewers who are reading your submission don't know who you are. Now the committee itself who's doing the final selection of the talk does know who people are because they obviously have to reach out, say hi, uh, tell you that you're accepted, but everybody else, like that information, just not shown. So once you enter in all of the, your name, your email and everything, the next part you get to is what is your title? Uh, I would say don't stress out about it too much. Like some people try to be way too, uh, I think they've spent way too much time on the title and not enough on the next part, which is what is kind of the quick summary. So we ask you for three pieces of information are required and one's optional. So required is title, the summary, uh, outline, and the optional part is notes. And so you have to put in some kind of talk, title, every talk has one. Uh, worst case scenario though, we do let speakers tweak that title after acceptance. So it doesn't have to be perfect, just try and get it as good as possible. Then in the summary section, what the goal is, is to enter in enough information 
to tell somebody reading it, because remember, they don't know who you are, why this topic is relevant to the Diana Initiative, why you're qualified to talk about it, and the fact that you're actually going to give the audience something to go home with. And you can do that by writing some paragraphs. You could do that by doing a little outline where you use dashes, like whatever format, it's just an open paragraph text box. And then there's a note section. So in the note section, sometimes people, you know, go ahead and tip their hand to the CFP group. Like they'll say, uh, I'm planning to do this through memes or I'm planning to do this through a choose your own adventure story to be more interactive with the audience. But you can kind of give hints of how the talk is going to pop more than just the word that you've put ahead of it. And that kind of gives everyone an idea. Because remember right now, um, everyone is only reading this really fast. We've got hundreds of these to get through. Is there a little piece of information you could give that makes it a little more unique? And that's it. Once you enter in all of that information, you hit submit and it goes into the queue. All of the reviewers go through and then they rank it. And um, I can tell you for TDI, how we rank it is, how is the quality of the submission? And I can dig into that a little bit, as well as how applicable to the conference it is. So there's, it's a two part score. And what do we mean by how good is the submission? It's when I read it, do I know who your target audience is? So if you say this is a blue team talk, but you write like a super generic abstract, it's like, is it really for blue team? Or did you just take something you applied some other conference and then slap it in? You know, so it's like, did you actually target the group? Cause you can pick, you know, I'm targeting red team, blue team, whomever. So, you know, were you able to tell me who you were trying to talk to? Does it fit into our conference? And can I tell what the takeaway is? And that's that score. And then the second score is just, does it apply to our conference? Like sometimes there's really interesting talks that are getting into like, you know, the economics of ransomware. That's, it's kind of a harder sell at our event because we try and do, you know, specific red team, blue team, we're not targeting, you know, insurance, we're not targeting maybe your CFOs. And so those audience members are not necessarily there. So maybe you did a really good submission, but we think its applicability is a little bit lower because we don't think there's gonna be a high percentage of people there at our event. So it's a two part score. Everybody on the committee scores get averaged together and that's how you either bubble up toward the top or not. Nice. And would you say that that process is a pretty universal process for submitting the CFP or is it something more um, specific to the Diana initiative? It is similar to a lot of other conferences. So uh, for everyone who wasn't here, uh, we were chit chatting in the beginning. I'm actually on four CFP committees just this month uh, throughout, throughout a given year. I'm on a lot of different committees and in general, I would say that is how most work, but you're gonna have a little bit of range between, like I said, whether it's blind or not. So do you need to be selling yourself to the reviewers or not? So as an example, for Anita B, Grace Hopper, uh, that's not blind. And so you should in your bio, basically hint at, I have X number of years experience in data science or programming or whatever, to kind of show why you are qualified to give that talk. Whereas in ours, you more just have to kind of show it through talking about relevant items. There's also some conferences that are more academic. When they say call for papers, they literally mean they expect you to have like a one page or possibly longer academic style paper because it's a call for paper not a call for presentation ours is a call for presentation so we just ask you like fill in one to three paragraphs whatever you're comfortable with and a lot of times look to see if there is an example on the website because like schmoocon defcon a lot of them all will have here is an example of a submission and you can like look to see okay how long is that one and I would definitely pay attention to any limits on length because some conferences say you can't be over, you know, a thousand words or 2000 words. And so if you go over that, they might just cut you off. Uh, I also run CFP for Sky Talk some years that it's running. And if you run extra long beyond something we've asked for, I just cut it off. 
and nobody gets to read that second part where maybe you made your conclusion. Uh, and I know at a need to be, if you don't follow the rules, they'll actually just throw out your submission in its entirety. So in general though, everybody wants, who are you? What's your talk title? Tell us like the abstract a little bit about it in general. Some people do require an outline. We make it optional. I highly recommend doing it anyway. And an outline doesn't have to be detailed. It's just like, I'm gonna start with introducing the topic in general. And then I'm gonna go for five minutes on about the latest cool attack in the space that was in the news. And, you know, just really quick bullet points so they can see the flow. Uh, and then, like I said, some will require you to actually upload a paper, uh, others won't, but that's about it for most of the conferences that I've seen. Nice. Uh, and earlier, you mentioned something about the quality of the submission. Uh, can you expand a little bit more on that? Let's see. Virginia, can you think of any like super good examples from this year or last year? Um, not right at the top of my head. Uh, so what, what constitutes a good quality paper mm -hmm. presentation? Um, Chloe well, really usually depends. does really yeah. good submissions. I just can't recall the format she uses. I can give you an example of a bad submission. Um, and obviously I don't know who submitted this, um, but the entire abstract was one sentence and that was it. And so there was a title, there was one sentence and that's all the information I had to decide whether or not this submission would get a 45 minute spot at our conference. So I obviously said this is a very poor quality and it's also a very poor fit for our event. Um, I think with Chloe's, she usually does, um, so when you look at a conference guide, usually there's like that three sentences that the conference publishes so that you can read and decide if you wanna to go to a talk or not. And I believe what happens is Chloe puts in her sentences at the top that say, you know, like basically the advertising snippets or your marketing, then gets into a little bit about the outline and then we'll put like a little summary at the end of like the key takeaway is X. And so that format for me, I think is a very well done thing because you can see what is the kind of marketing hook that you're going for. Are you going for cute memes? Are you going for the, you know, uh, clickbait top 10? Like what is your draw to pull people into your event? What kind of are the areas you're gonna cover? And then the summary at the end is actually something not a lot of people call out, but I recommend doing it. And it basically says, the goal is for the audience to go home with this skill or this information or whatever it is you want the audience to go home with because that helps the CFP reviewers decide if you've really thought through the process. Okay, and based off of that, would you say that, um, would you definitely say that probably the big, one of the biggest tips is to do an outline and really like have a solid outline of your presentation when you know preparing your CFP or is it really more so like the abstract summary of your presentation? Yeah, we don't, um, uh, the, uh, the outline is kind of optional for us. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we should make it man mandatory uh, because that gives us a good idea of uh, if there's enough talks and enough information to last a world hour. A lot of the time uh, when I read the feedback, it said not enough information to know if it's gonna be uh, good enough for like an hour or 20 minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you have an outline with like timing, like I'm gonna spend 10 minutes on this, I'm gonna spend 15 minutes on, and you know that there's enough material to cover to last a world hour. And uh, Nicole, do you want to add to? <laughs> uh, if I had to pick one thing to be most important, it's that someone knows what the point is. I, and I know that sounds really vague, but like if you hand your submission to a friend, a family member, like 
random person, uh, harder during COVID, but just let somebody else read it and then ask them, what was the point of my talk? Like, why, what was, what am I talking about and why? If they can tell you that, you're doing very well. Because a lot of times people will submit something that seems like an interesting idea, but I don't understand why they're trying to do a talk on it. Like, and this one's a completely made up example, but you're gonna tell me about pet shelters. Okay, cool, pet shelters. I love pets and I think pet shelters could be a cool thing, but why? Are you trying to tell me so I can build my own pet shelter? Are you trying to tell me because there's not enough pet shelters? Are you trying to tell me because you wanna get me to donate? Like, what was the point of the presentation? If somebody can't read it and come away with it, it's like, you're not doing your job as a presenter because the audience needs to, at the end, understand what you were trying to tell them. Okay. And so once someone is selected at, you know, if their CF, if their CFP is approved, how, how does that process work after that? Um, yeah, so once uh, they are accepted, uh, we send them an email congratulating them. <laughs> And, uh, and then there's this whole process to get them or to get all the information we need from them because sometimes they don't have, they didn't have a time or they were in a hurry. Uh, they didn't put their pictures or they didn't uh, give enough information about, uh, you know, their uh, social media information, for instance. Uh, so we, we kind of go through that and, and and then um, later on, uh, once the schedule is done, because first we accept them, but then we, there's no real schedule yet. Uh, so once we have the, the schedule, then uh, if there's any conflict with their time, then they, they have a chance to, to change it. Um, if there's room uh, at, at different times, you can swap with someone else. Um, and uh, if, uh, if, they, if they were accepted in round one, uh, then the mentor, uh, mentorship team, um, that's one of the options actually, if they want to be mentored and they would take over and uh, ask them to, uh, ask them if they want to be mentored and uh, assign them with a mentor. And then they can help them uh, with, um, with our presentation or there's two different types. There's the uh, call for paper itself, which if you're rejected, actually, that's when you get a chance to, to be mentored that, like that. But uh, for round two, if you're accepted, then um, they will assign you a mentor to, uh, to coach you through, um, through the, your presentation. Um, you know, like, do you have enough presentation information? Uh, how many? How many slides do you have? Do you have too many slides? I remember that's what happened with me when, when I was uh, being coached. I had too many slides. <laughs> I had like 60 slides. <laughs> so they will help you kind of trim things down. And, and so you're not supposed to spell out everything that's in your presentation uh, uh, PowerPoint, PowerPoint because that's bad. You're supposed to just have like nice pictures and nice thing on your presentation, but all the discussion has to come from you. <laughs> it's the best. Uh, so they will teach you all that. Um, and then once you have a, uh, once you are accepted, so um, you will send you an email to assign you with a, a speaker wrangler that will uh, help you go through all the technicality and the q a in the end of a talk um, so like what question you want to be asked uh, and things like that so nicole you want to yeah the wranglers it? vary a lot by conference because i know virginie has been a wrangler for one event versus i've been wranglers for other events and so yeah, it's important for you as a speaker to think about, do you want to do Q and A or do you just want to invite people to email you and talk to you on social media? Um, Cause some people don't do good on the spot. And if that's not something that you do, just pick ahead of time, 
how do I want to be introduced? Do I want to do Q&A? Like figure out all of that stuff. Like if you've ever attended a conference, you kind of know the pattern. So figure out how you want all of that to go. And then you may get the opportunity to talk to your Wrangler days in advance. And in which case you can say, this is what I want. Do you want to read my introduction? I've kind of prepared what I want. Or do you want me to read it? And I do or don't want to do Q&A. And so you can work through that with them. In some cases, you meet your Wrangler like 10 minutes before your talk. So having thought about that ahead of time and, and written it down so that you're not stressed out by it can make a really big difference, especially if you do like a little index card with your intro, you will get the intro you want. Because I know uh, for luckily my name, most people can pronounce, but if you have a name that you know may not be as easy, doing a pronunciation guide and going through your Wrangler with that once or twice ahead of time, that should be something a good Wrangler does. But somebody may be a Wrangler for the first time and they may be stressed out and they may not be thinking about that. So having the card where you get your pronunciation, where you work and any kind of cool accomplishments that you wanna mention on a piece of paper that you can hand to someone or you can read yourself. So be ready to do it both ways is super important. And then sometimes there's also a green room uh, our event sort of sometimes has a green room. It's not as nice as some others, but it gives you a chance to go check that you can hook into the projector and that your clicker works and you have batteries in it. So whatever you need to do, or in our case for the virtual event, can you figure out how to share your screen? Does your microphone work well with the AV system? So if you can always ask about those things so you can practice ahead of time, talk to the person ahead of time, and then actually give your talk, which is kind of the most exciting and terrifying part of this entire process. Oh, and also right. we encourage everyone to uh, to have a pre-recorded video uh, just in case something goes completely wrong. Uh, <laughs> Fires like in California it. last year was a big one. A lot of people had to duck out last minute because, you know, stuff was on fire. Right, and so that kind of segues into another question that I had for you both, because um, it kind of, you know, goes like you were, you were giving kind of tips on your presentations, you know, like making sure you meet with your Wrangler, check out the green room if it's available, pre-record yourself just in case something goes horribly wrong and you're not able to actually give your presentation. Do you have any other tips about giving a presentation or how to prepare yourself for when you for when you speak don't wait last minute to do the, the to upload the video the pre-recorded video if you plan on doing that <laughs> because it takes a while for the upload to uh, to occur and and speak very clearly articulate everything you say especially if you uh, you you have some kind of an accent like I do. Um, it, you know, you understand yourself, but most everyone else might not understand what you're saying. So it's important to speak very slowly and clearly. <laughs> and even if you don't have an accent, I talk faster when I get excited and then people can't understand me. So 100% echo, speak clearly, enunciate if you've ever taken theater, all of those lessons basically apply when you're giving a presentation. So try and conscientiously go slow, pronounce everything. And if there is closed captioning turned on, for example, if you have, if you're giving a presentation and they tell you that they don't have closed captioning available, using Office 365 or Google Slides, you can actually enable auto captioning. It's not the best, but it is better than nothing. And if you articulate and go slowly, it has a better chance of captioning you. Also, if there is a live human captioning, which we're gonna have for at least one of our tracks this year, which is, I'm very excited about. Uh, we'd love to have it for more tracks. We just need some more company sponsors for that. There's a live human trying to type what you're saying. And if you're going very fast or not enunciating, they're going to have problems typing that. And so to make your talk accessible to the most number of people possible, just try and as excited as you are, go slow, be clear. Don't drink soda. <laughs> I've got like, I have a page somewhere, um, which I will attempt to in a moment, uh, 
grab and, and post in the chat here, but I crowdsourced ideas from Twitter about uh, talk suggestions. And one of the most popular ones was avoid soda right before your talk if you're someone who's prone to burping, because uh, that could be an interesting interruption to your talk. Uh, I know I'm nervous, so I always make sure to go pee before I give my talk. Um, and then Virginia, you brought up a good one earlier. Don't read your slides. Have, have some points on your slides, have some cute memes on your slides, but you should have run through your slides often enough that you can talk. Uh, actually, my talk at Diana Initiative, we had some AV problems and my computer kept freezing. So I basically gave my talk without the slides and occasionally the slides would come back and I actually had practiced enough that the slides would come back with the correct slide, duck out again, I'd keep going and then a couple slides later it would be back. So you should be able to do it whether the AV is on or off, uh, don't rely on them. Yeah, I mean, um, I remember for this side, Las Vegas, Ring Ground, uh, there was cases where uh, some people are written on what they're going to say, you know, in, when you have a slide, you have like little hidden uh, window where you can type whatever you're planning on saying. And, but for that to work, you have to have, to be able to have, to see your slide on your, on your laptop, as well as the screen below. Right. And there was a situation where you can only show your slide on one screen. So it's either your laptop or or the screen, the projector. So <laughs> that person was kind of a SOL because she didn't know what to say anymore <laughs> because she didn't have the information on what to say. So it's very important to, uh, to take um, into consideration those kind of situation where um, you might not have the, anything written down. You have to memorize what you have to say or improvise. And there's also nothing wrong with paper. Uh, I know Jack Daniel occasionally will print out not what he's going to say, but reminder points and place them down. Uh, if uh, when he's doing stand up or when he's doing a keynote, he'll have a couple of reminder pieces of paper around so he can track what he is saying and move through. And so if you do need some pieces of paper, that is completely legitimate. Go for it. Uh, whatever works for you. Uh, try and scope out ahead of time. Like, is there going to be a podium for you to put stuff or not? You can usually put things on the floor. If you practice, you'll probably figure out whether you're a person who paces or not. If you are a person who paces, ask the venue if they have a lavalier mic or a portable mic. Because if you're someone who paces and the microphone is affixed to the podium, the audience will have a hard time hearing you. And some conferences, if you ask, will have a lavalier mic. If you're planning to have a lavalier mic and you're a lady, I suggest having a belt. Even if your clothing does not need a belt, wear a belt anyway, put a belt on that dress, uh, do what you need to do to have somewhere to clip the lavalier mic Worst case scenario, you can clip it in your pantyhose. It's awkward. I don't fully recommend that because then you have to like fish it in down the back of your dress and everything else. So having a cute decorative belt that can hold up a lavalier mic will save you. Um, I know there's a couple other things. Carry a Band-Aid with you. Sounds weird, but at least for me, um, I guess I have big ears, which you can't see because I got the headset on. But when I clip the lavalier mic over my ear, it tends to actually be far enough away from my mouth that people can't hear me very well. So what I'll end up having to do is stick a little Band-Aid to keep it against my face so people can hear me well for different presentations. Having a Band-Aid on you at all times is also generally a good idea. Uh, so for ladies in the audience, the other thing is watch out, there might be chairs. Uh, some places, if you're doing a panel or so on and so forth, you are on a raised platform. You may then be asked to sit. So consider, I would suggest skirts below the knee. Uh, if you're a conference organizer, I also suggest maybe not making ladies sit or asking them ahead of time if they'd prefer a bar stool or something, because uh, I don't think anybody wants the audience looking up their skirt. Uh, so there's things, yeah, to consider mm for the diverse audience that I think 
conference organizers like me and Virginia are probably going to think about, whereas a guy running a conference may not. So you as a lady may need to consider those things on your own. Uh, how stable is the stage? It may not be great to wear heels. Uh, some people obviously look amazing in heels, but if the stage is a little wibbly wobbly, it might be time to wear like chunky platforms instead. Obviously that applies more once we get out of COVID, <laughs> but uh, there's a bunch of stuff like that. Oh. And everybody it's loves kittens. kittens, so bring kittens to your talk. It'll <laughs> plus one well, all the time. Yeah, my kitty is very friendly and um, wants attention all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks. Those were that was a lot of tips, but a lot of a lot of good tips. Some that you know even I wouldn't have thought about. I'm still thinking about that band aid one, but you know I guess accidents. Accidents happen, so you just have to be prepared for everything. Um, and then one more question I had is, what has been your favorite presentation that you've seen presented at the Diana Initiative? Or if you have multiples, you can state those too. There There's have been many. so many, but yeah, it's hard <laughs> to really pinpoint one. They are like always been amazing. Uh, yeah, so I mean, obviously, the keynotes, uh, like last year, uh, there were some keynotes that were pretty, pretty damn good. Um, you know, they really uh, uh, inspire the crowd. Um, one in particular from uh, Julie Okafort. Julia Cafford, uh, she was pretty amazing. Um, some people were in tears because they got so inspired by, by what she said. Uh, she was describing her experience. And yeah, and I mean, it, it did, no, regardless of the topic, uh, we had like pretty damn good uh, talk last year. Uh, like if I have to think really like in the immediate past, uh, day of security, I liked Alyssa Miller's uh, talk. Um, if I go back a little bit further for Pancakes Con, uh, there was a talk by Cthulhu on um, just uh, how to handle crowds as like a medic. And that got into, you know, how do you prepare properly for stuff, which applies whether you're in IT or if you're handling first aid for crowds. It's like, how do you take care of yourself and how do you take care of others and how do you triage things? And so that was a really fun talk because uh, I love what Leslie did with Pancakes Con of taking people's hobbies. And I'm sure a lot of people have seen the presentations like learn threat modeling by uh, talking about this dating app. And so just making it more accessible uh, to everyone and then if I think back uh, even further, um, actually something that pops to mind is from ShmooCon. Uh, the last time we were able to have a ShmooCon, there was a dad-daughter pair where the daughter came up with an idea of how do you share an Instagram account between multiple people to mess with the tracking algorithms. And that was like a really interesting talk. And her dad was kind of her mentor on how to give the presentation, but he was super clear. She came up with the topic. She presented the topic. He just was kind of there to add advice and, and help answer things. And then I think from our last conference, I loved so much stuff, but I think um, Career Village had, a, um, I'm going to forget her name. She was a nurse. So if you can go look up the presentation, uh, there was a nurse and it, the, the title of the talk was something about like, there is no snacks. Um, and it was just an interesting journey of somebody who didn't start out necessarily wanting to be in information security, but ended up in information security. Was it Jelena? It wasn't Jelena who okay. does usually give that, that talk, but no, it was um, somebody else. Nice. Those are all really, those all sound like really awesome presentations. Um, so we're about 10 minutes away from closing this out. Do we have any questions from anyone 
in the audience, any of our attendees, you know, anything you would like to ask for Ginny or Nicole, you just put it into the chat or put it into the Q&A box. You can find that in the bottom right corner on Zoom. We'd love to hear any questions that you have. Um, and then while we wait for that, um, I guess one question, I think we had chatted about it in the beginning before um, we started the AMA. Uh, can you, I, I think maybe it was Virginie was saying that you know, you've gotten some presentations, but, um, oh, there's a question in the audience one. Yeah, I think I can answer that. So the question was uh, that you can submit an idea that's not fully formed uh, and get a mentor to help flesh out the idea. And that is sort of true. Your talk does need to score high enough to be accepted to get a mentor. So what I would do is in the notes section, like I said, you can tip your hand to the CFP committee in the notes section is just be clear, like I am a new speaker and I have this idea and I believe that I could, you know, punch it up if I got a mentor, but your idea still needs to be an idea, like I said, with a point. So if your idea was talking about how I could have prevented the um, evil twin attack or the solar winds attack, write your abstract about that where you're talking about, this is my goal. And then you can go ahead and say, I think I'd wanna do it this way, but I'm not sure. And I would need a mentor to help flesh it out because I'm not familiar with giving uh, talks. and people could take that into account when they were scoring. Because like I said, one is applicability. Does this apply to our audience? So as long as your topic and takeaway apply to the audience, you can get full points on that. And then as far as the quality of the submission, if in that submission, you're very clear about this is what I wanna cover, but I'm not sure how best to cover it. We could say like, okay, you've got your main arc and you know you need a mentor and give you a better score than somebody who's like, nah, I'm fine, I don't need a mentor. Nice, that's good to know. Um, and then uh, the question I wanted to ask earlier is that I know uh, you all had said that um, you have had submissions and there's some areas that um, you would like more submissions for for the conference. Can you give a little info on what areas you're looking for? So right now we're looking for um, red team and purple team uh, submission. So those are like uh, attack uh, related uh, um, submission. <laughs> I don't know, I think, I'm pretty sure everyone know what red team is, but uh, so there's like blue team, red team and purple team. Um, so red team is more like you are the hacker and you are attacking uh, a system. Uh, or network. Um, blue team is more like on the defensive side where you, you're trying to prevent an attack uh, by uh, making the system very secure and safe. And purple is kind of like a middle, you're, you're trying to do both. Um, so right now of, we, are, we don't have a lot of talk submission on, on red team and purple team. So we really appreciate, you know, any kind of submission related to um, hacking into a system. <laughs> There's also a trick that applies usually to most conferences, honestly. If you can do a technical deep dive into a particular area, that is usually less populated. I'm not sure how else to explain that. Because when we're trying to fill our schedule, we want to have entry-level talks, mid-level talks, and senior-level talks. And we get the fewest, and this is across every CFP board I've ever been on, we get the fewest senior-level submissions. And that's red team, blue team, purple team, any of them. Because it is stressful to say, I am qualified enough to give a senior team talk. But honestly, if you've been doing something for a couple of years, even if you think everybody knows this particular thing, you're going to look at it in a different way than other people. So if you can do a deep dive into 
proper configuration of SAML or, you know, the best way to parse log files using Perl out of, you know, Kibana, whatever it is, if there is a small niche that you do often and you have figured out what you think is a really great way to do it, go ahead, do a senior level talk and you will have so much less competition because so many people submit into that entry level spot. And so if you're doing a higher level spot, it's going to have a higher chance because there's just less competition. Awesome. And uh, the conference is currently in the midst of your second round for CFPs, correct? Um, correct. And those are due when? Oh goodness, I need to check. <laughs> In, I think, May something, May uh, 15, I think. May 22nd, second round notifications yeah. are sent, but you need to get them in by May 7th. And so basically between the 7th and the 22nd, our job is to read everything that everyone sends us. Um, so May 7th is when it needs to be in by, which means May 6th and 7th, we will get the majority of the things submitted because <laughs> that's the way it goes. And you don't read it ahead of time, right? You just, once submissions are closed, that's when you start evaluating. Everything. It completely depends on the reviewer. I actually have a calendar item where every single day I log into BusyConf and read whatever's in there. Other people read it once a week. Other people wait until they're all in and then just plow through it in a weekend. But since we get hundreds of submissions, um, I would rather just knock it off day by day. Right. So that probably also means that if you want to submit a CFP and get accepted earlier, better. It, the, the likelihood of people being stressed is definitely a higher if you wait till last week. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's say you would get a better review if you submit earlier because uh, most, uh, the majority of people, they tend to submit like two days before, two or one day before the, the closing of a submission round and and then you would get you know all these reviewers that are forced to review your uh, submission at the last minute uh, so as opposed to if you would have submit a week earlier uh, all the reviewers would have all eyes on your submission solely <laughs> and give you better feedback um, because we ask all our reviewers to to provide uh, feedback uh, two different types of feedback, feedback to the, to the chair, call for per, per chair, and also feedback that the chair would give to, to the reviewer in case they get rejected, uh, which is a great feedback because then if it's, especially they uh, submit in round one, they can resubmit um, and fix those, those feedback uh, uh, comment. So, uh, so the sooner you, you submit, the more the reviewer is going to be in great mood to, to really focus on your paper and the give as much feedback as possible. The comment, yeah, the length of the comment is way longer when you have like two to review that day because you have more time to put in a thoughtful comment as opposed to when you have 20 to review that day and you know everybody might get one sentence or two sentence. And I guess one thing I really want everyone to to take away is just because your talk gets rejected does not mean your talk is a bad talk. You may have submitted on a topic that was really popular. And so you have been in competition against a lot of people. And so you may have been just a fraction less interesting for some reason than the person who's talking on your topic. So do not be discouraged, apply to a different conference, obviously tweak it to fit their conference better. But just because you don't get accepted to a conference does not mean it was not a good talk. It means that they had to give that spot to somebody else who did. It could have literally in some cases, it will be 0 0.01 points higher than you. So. All right. Well, I wanted to thank you both. Um, you know, we've reached the top of the hour. So. Thank you, Virginie and Nicole, for taking the time out of your day to speak with us about the Diana Initiative and about the process of submitting a CFP and making all of us more confident to submit a, submit a paper, submit a presentation, and give a talk at a conference.
And thank you for having us, April. Yes, it's CNC. Thank you, thank you. And I look forward to reading everybody's stuff because I read it, like I said, every day. So come on, give me <laughs> things to read. All right. All right, everyone. Well, see you. Bye.